Uh, Bills fans representing this morning, so uh, yeah. <laughs> Go Bills. And in case you're wondering, you have seen other jerseys from other teams also represented here this morning. And we are a safe place to find faith, friends, <laughs> in your future. Did everybody enjoy uh, uh, my friend Pastor Chris last Sunday and the message that he gave? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're continuing on in our series on the Holy Spirit. Today I want to talk to you about something that has to do with something we do every day, uh, sometimes with lesser issues, sometimes with greater issues, and that's make decisions. We, we make decisions. Um, most of us decided uh, what we were going to wear when we got here today. And uh, so that's on you, like this is what you chose. <laughs> And for the most part, when people tell me I look good, it's usually because my wife purchased it for me, and, and uh, that's how that works. We have lots of decisions that we make, and, and we know, like, we have a sense that, that God wants to help us in our decisions, but how does that actually work out? And we know that there's a lot of guidelines in the Bible. For example, you know, if, if you're wondering, should you tell the truth or, or lie, Scripture says, you know, lean in on the truth. That's always your better option, even if it's harder in the moment. But there's lots of things that Scripture doesn't weigh in on. For example, who are you supposed to marry? You can go, doesn't matter what translation, from Genesis to Revelation, you will not find the verse that says, and this is the person that you are supposed to marry, or this is how you're supposed to manage your time today, or this is the school you should apply to, or this is how many kids you should have, or this is the company you should work for, or this is the house that you should buy. It seems as though that there are a lot of decisions in life that we don't have a specific reference in Scripture to help us. And the thing is, we all want to make good decisions, which creates anxiety in us, right? Because we have a sense, am I making a bad choice? And, and we, we want to make good choices, sometimes for selfish reasons, but sometimes we just we want to make a good choice. And so how do we, how do we think about that? And the, and the question is here, if I make the wrong choice, if I marry the wrong person, if I, if I apply to the wrong school, if I, if I sign up for the wrong company, does that, mean, does that mean that I'm out of God's will? Does that mean that God cannot bless me now? And you can almost tense, you can sense the tension in the room uh, surrounding those. These are important things. Uh, this is what I do believe. I believe that God did not create us to be robots that are programmed uh, with every specific move that we are to make throughout the course of our lives. That's not God's plan for us. That's, that's artificial intelligence. How many would prefer actual intelligence to artificial intelligence? Yeah. Uh, God is more interested in helping us when we're facing decisions rather than just telling us what it is specifically we're supposed to do to help us understand how to see this situation, the things that are around it, who's impacted by it, what some of the long-term trajectory realities are. And so we often think, well, what's the good decision and what's the bad decision? And the truth is, is that sometimes, often, it's not a choice between good and bad, it's a choice between good and good. There's actually not a, a bad choice to make. So sometimes we can learn a little bit by asking God, what's the wise decision to make? Because sometimes you actually have choices, multiple choices that are all good. So I'd, I'd like us to take a peek at the scripture today, and it, it's filled with... Uh, just an amazing example of decision making that I don't hear talked a lot about in, in, Christi in Christianity. And uh, this is what it says. When I came to the city of Troas, and this is the Apostle Paul, when I came to the city of Troas to preach the good news of Christ, the Lord, the Lord opened a door of opportunity for me. But I had no peace of mind because my dear brother Titus hadn't yet arrived with a report from you. And he's referring to the church in Corinth. He hadn't arrived with a report from you, so I said goodbye and went on to Macedonia to find him. <laughs> Paul's in Troas. There's an open door of opportunity. You would think that decision made. 
He's there to preach the good news. God has opened the door of opportunity. The decision is made. But he was unsettled by the absence of someone that was very important to him. Paul had two young men in ministry that were like sons to him. One was Timothy and the other was Titus. And Titus uh, was known for a couple of things. One is his maturity. He was wise beyond his years. But secondly, he was also really good at conflict resolution. And, and Paul would send him to congregations that were, were not getting along very well. And they were, they were dealing with strife and division. And he would send Titus in. And Titus was able to resolve many of those conflicts. And Titus hadn't shown up. And, and Paul is concerned. And he says, there's an open door. There's an opportunity that God has provided for ministry. But I have these concerns about Titus and the church in Corinth. And so he makes a decision. And his decision is not to shut the door on Macedonia, but to take a detour. He's going to go and he's going to look for Titus. He's going to find him. He took a detour. The thing about a detour is, uh, have you, has anybody ever seen a, a sign that says detour ahead and been happy about it? <laughs> I never have. I, I, uh, it, it's when I'm reminded that, that my, uh, my, my, my maps on my phone are not as smart as I wish they were, because they should have picked up on that. You know? <laughs> and they didn't. And uh, we, we don't get excited about it, but what it does is it adds time, right? That's why we're not excited. It adds time. And the thing is about a detour and a decision in life is it can add time to think, that's a good thing, and to pray, also a good thing. And Paul needs some time to think and to pray. And so he adds a detour. What is he doing? He's improvising in the pursuit of God's will. Improvisation. This is a word not usually associated with our faith. And yet that's exactly what Paul is doing. He's looking for a solution in the moment. That there, there are conflicting realities. There are things that are not quite working together. He has mixed emotions about things. He understands what's going on. He's not in denial, but he needs a solution. And so what he does is he kind of improvises. And we understand improvisation when it comes to other areas of life. For, for example, music. Right? People can improvise in music. There's whole genres of music built around this. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not just a bunch of instrumentalists or vocalists getting together and doing whatever they want. They, they kind of have to agree on what key they're in and what tempo they're playing to and, 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 and a basic chord structure. But then someone will do something that, that hasn't been programmed or written out or planned. It's, it's not there, but they're adding to it. And, and someone will hear that, someone else. They'll add something to that, and they, they just kind of feed back and forth off of each other. What are they doing? They're improvising. And some of the most enjoyable music that you can experience in life is, is based on, on improvisation, but uh, also acting. Acting. You, you can improvise in acting. It's when a person is not just simply tied to a script, but they're in the moment. They trust their instincts. They trust their talent in that moment. They, they're, they're reacting and responding to the things that are going on around them. For, for example, there's some lines, famous lines in movies that were improvised. They were not in the script. Uh, for example, yeah, if you remember the, the movie Jaws, the line, we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> not in the script. But it was so good they kept it. Right? Or, or how about this? Uh, the Titanic. When Leonardo DiCaprio's can, uh, character is standing on the bow of the ship, hands in the air, and he says, I'm the king of the world. Not in the script. But we can't imagine that movie without that scene, can we? A few good men. Jack Nicholas's character is on the stand. And he says, you can't. <laughs> Not in the script. Not in the script. Isn't that amazing? 
And yet we can't imagine. It's the iconic line out of that movie. What happened? Somebody improvised in the moment based on what they were experiencing, what they were sensing, what they're responding to it. And it, it kind of crystallizes it. It helps us understand that. Uh, they do it in comedy, too. Uh, you, uh, you get a group of comedians together and you give them kind of a prompt or you, you give them a suggestion and then they begin to run with it. And what they come up with is something that is, is supposedly or hopefully funny. And, and here's the thing. In all of those things, in all of those things, there's an element of freedom. Scripture seems to indicate that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of freedom. And instead of us just trying to do, okay, at 9.02, I will turn right. The Holy Spirit wants us to be paying attention to what's going on around us, to be in the moment that we're living in, to be noticing what's happening, to, to understand the options that are in front of us, and to be able to improvise in our decision making. And, and I know some of you are going, I just wish it was the program thing. Just give me the cheat code. I'd rather do that. And, and you could, but your life will be less. Your life will be less. What are keys to successful improvisation? So one is you just have to listen actively. You have to pay attention to what's going on around you. So there's, there's a lot of freedom that can occur when you're syncing with other people that are around you. You, you, you stay present. You, you stay in the moment with someone. You're, you're not far away, distant. Like I tell uh, when our staff gets together for, for planning meetings on our services, I tell them all the time. I say, well, when we are out in, in, in front of people on Sunday, there are people that are time traveling right now. There are people, it looks like you're here, but you're not. <laughs> you're not. You're in tomorrow or something later in the week. You're in something that happened a couple days ago. There is this virtual reality of you sitting in the room, but you are not here. You are not here. How do you learn to stay in the moment? And, and how do you learn to respect the team, the people that are around you? Because when you're improvising, it's not just you driving everything. You have to feed off of other people. And sometimes you're taking the lead, but sometimes you're following someone taking the lead. And this is all part of improvisation. And, and this is what I want us to know. When we learn how to incorporate this concept of improvisation into our lives, we'll actually wind up making, are you ready for it? We'll wind up making better decisions, better decisions. We make better decisions when we learn to listen actively. Listen actively. We have to listen to what's going on around us. We have to learn how to listen to what the Holy Spirit might be whispering to us. One of our values around here, we don't have a lot of named values, but one of our values is something called spiritual sensitivity. And it's just based on this. We want to, to know what to say and to know what to pray. And to be able to do that, we trust that we can listen before we speak. In fact, uh, why don't you just right now, since that's such a good point, uh, why don't you look at the person next to you right now with a smile on your face? Because if you say it without a smile, they'll, they'll think you mean something else. But just look at them and say, you should listen before you speak. Yeah. Yeah. Some of you are saying a lot more than that. But I know you were listening, and then you had something to say. The, the Holy Spirit generally speaks through Scripture, and not just in terms of commands and, and guidelines, but uh, examples of how God has spoken to other people in the past, and, and, and in application. Like sometimes we'll be reading through a passage, and, and we'll say, oh, if I applied that to my situation, it might look like this. It's a wonderful way for the Holy Spirit to speak to us, but also the Holy speaks to us through prayer. And this happens basically in a couple ways. One of the repeating phrases you see in scripture is that the Holy Spirit said, and how did that happen? Was it someone giving a prophetic word? Was it a message in tongues and interpretation? Like, how did, how did they know that? Sometimes it was just a, a person by themselves. And, and the way they tell the story is that the Holy Spirit told me. And how, how did they know? And basically, it, it, is, it comes in one of two ways. Uh, there's not these audible voices. Imagine, imagine this morning if the Holy Spirit spoke audibly to every single one of us in the room. Uh, well, we would be here quite a long time. 
Uh, the Holy Spirit has this capacity to communicate that doesn't require vocalization. Because all vocalization really does is it, it transmits a thought. Right now I'm vocalizing. I'm transmitting a thought that I have to you the way I do that as I vocalize. And then you hear what I'm saying and then, and then you can process that thought. And, and isn't it great that the Holy Spirit doesn't have to vocalize to transmit the thought? He can cut out this whole mental process. And so when we seek his guidance, usually his guidance shows up in one of a couple ways. One is, is insight. It's, it's like a light comes out. We understand something about the situation that we're dealing with that we didn't see before. Oh, that's what's going on. And that insight can be so powerful in helping us to know what to do next. Uh, there's another thing. The Holy Spirit can give us a prompting, an action item, some, a, a little task to do. Something will come to our mind. And it's amazing how many times we just go, yeah, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's just me. Okay. It could be you. It could be you. I, I saw a t-shirt the other day. It said, I'm sorry I slapped you. <laughs> but you wouldn't stop talking, and I panicked. <laughs> that's not the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But often we'll have this little, little insight that comes, something you could say or an action you could take, and we so easily dismiss it. And what if that was the Holy Spirit actually trying to help us in that moment, to actively listen to what he is saying to us? Uh, being led by the Spirit isn't just an individual thing either. It, it, it's, it's, it's a corporate reality that what God is doing in all of our lives affects each of our lives. No. Uh, I actually try to pay attention to the things that God is doing in other churches in our area because I don't assume, well, I'm glad God is doing that over there, but he's doing this here. Our community is our community. Our community is made up of a bunch of people who live here, some who are churchgoers and some who are not. And I don't think that God is doing something in this place like this and in that place like that. I think if we paid attention to all the things that he's doing, we would understand his will a lot better. We could lean into that. So we don't, we don't have to live our spiritual life in isolation. We can be part of a community. And I think we will make better decisions if we understand the danger of false peace, the danger of false peace. Because Paul said he wasn't at peace because his, his friend was not present. Uh, for most of us, we think we will have peace if we avoid conflict. Some of us just hate conflict. There's a, there's a few of you in the room. You love it. But most people just, just hate it. And... Uh, we might want to avoid something that's this uncomfortable, that, that is uh, uh, painful. Um, what I can tell you is that seeking our personal comfort is not always the best way to make our best decisions. Nobody ever got a gold medal in the Olympics by seeking personal comfort. Uh, maybe you've been pursuing uh, God's will and you're experiencing some challenges. And you know what, the, you know what our thought process is? Oh, I must have misunderstood the will of God. I don't understand what's going on here. Maybe I'm out of God's will. Our aversion to facing challenges should not drive our decision making. I can give you something else that's a much better tool for decision making than, than responding to whether we think something is hard or easy, and that is our conviction. Making decisions with a tool of conviction winds up being much more effective than making decisions trying to avoid hard things. And our conviction is not that we're right. That's, that's what it means in our culture now. Well, I'm convinced I'm right. Well, good for you. I'm happy for you. Our conviction is not that we're right about everything. Our conviction is that God is with us through everything. That's our conviction. That can really impact our decision making. And we'll make better decisions when we focus on obedience over outcomes. We start doing a mental math about how something is going to turn out or how someone might respond. And we start trying to control how it's going to turn out instead of what our responsibility is in the midst of it. We want, we want, don't we? We want to guarantee that things are going to work out the way we want. God, you tell me who I'm supposed to marry. And now it's just going to be a beautiful marriage every day of our life. It's going to be wonderful. Our, uh, uh, they will always look as beautiful and as handsome as they do right now. I, I think the whole thing about as you're getting older, losing some of your vision is God's plan. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. You're as beautiful as the day I met you. Right. 
leave the glasses on the side of the table. Um, we, we want to know that the company we work for is going to keep growing and won't have to lay anybody off. We, we want to know that our lives are going to be comfortable. That, and, and, and what are we really doing? We're trying to set ourselves up so that everything always works out for our best interest. Look at what Jesus had to say about this. Don't worry about those things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But let your heavenly Father, but your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. You see, a lot of times, I'm not seeking God's kingdom. I'm seeking my kingdom. And it's very interesting when you start processing decisions, not what is in my best interest, but what's in the best interest of the kingdom of God. That gives you new options to exercise. You can improvise off of that. I'll ask the worship team to come out. The will of God is actually not defeated by a poor choice. I'll say that again. The will of God is not defeated by a poor choice. God is not up in heaven chewing his fingernails and going, oh, if only they hadn't. Or if only they had. Now there's nothing more that I can do. You're going to make decisions that are not great decisions, and the good news for you is that's not the end of your spiritual journey. God is bigger than the decisions you have made. <laughs> Isn't that good news? God is bigger than the decisions you have made. And God can actually turn previous bad decisions into testimonies of his grace. That's what he's able to do. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit actually gives you agency. You get to make choices. This is what the Apostle Paul said. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. What is he saying? You have a choice. Obligation means no choice. You have a choice. What did Paul do? So I said goodbye. I went to Macedonia to find my friend. You are not obligated to keep allowing external pressures of people's expectations or internal pressures of your own expectations to decide all the things in your life. There's a kingdom that is an unending kingdom, and there's a king who is still on the throne, and he has a hope and a dream and a purpose for our lives that's still breathtaking. And if we're interested, if we're willing to be able to actively listen and stop making our decisions based on what's most comfortable for us and just see what God might want to do in the situation that we're facing, that could be amazing. Paul would go on to say this, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his sufferings. Spirituality is not about how do I avoid everything I don't like. Spirituality is how do I face the important things in life with someone who loves me more and knows me better than anyone else in the universe. And he is always, always for me. That's the way to think about it. So I'm going to give you a homework assignment. And I have to start by saying, I've never heard anybody talk about this. I didn't find this online. AI didn't tell me this. Um, I've looked through lots of books. I haven't found this, but I'm recommending it as a spiritual discipline to you. And, 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 and some of you might go, but what if you're wrong, Pastor Bob? This is called a decision. 
Have you ever had something that tasted exquisitely good? A friend of mine uh, got me a, a, a little treat. As it turns out, they're on the expensive side, but it's this very dark chocolate that's filled with this lemon filling. And I'm a big fan of, of chocolate. Um, most of you are aware of that. I believe there will be chocolate in heaven, just to let you know. And uh, I bit into that, and that combination of that lemon and that dark chocolate, it's one of the best things I have ever tasted in my life. And this is what I found myself doing. I, I took a bite, but oh. I didn't want it to be gone. If you've, have you ever listened to some music that was just, it surprised you by how good it was? And you're just, you're right there and you're going, oh. you go, oh. You wish the song wouldn't end. Or you're reading a book and it's so good. I actually know people who haven't finished a book because it was so good they didn't want to get to the end of it. That's true. What if that ability to savor the moment is actually a spiritual discipline? That your ability to be present, to appreciate what is happening right now, to, to listen to what's going on. For example, when you go home today, if the bills win, Savor the moment. We don't know when it's going to happen again. Just got to savor that. Or, or someone made whatever the, the football food choice of the day is, and, and you bite into something. If it's good, savor it. If you listen to some music, savor it. If you, if you have a few moments with a friend, savor it. If the conversation took a surprising turn and two hearts began to take off their invisibility cloaks and reveal themselves to savor that I believe, I believe this, that act of savoring is what helps us to be present in the moment, aware of what's going on around us. I actually think that that's an exercise for a spiritual discipline that helps us to be able to make better decisions in life. Not just saying, I always want everything to taste sweet and sound good. It's just saying, I'm aware of what's going on around me and now I have options. What do you think, is that a good idea? Yeah. Try it. Yeah. Let me know. If it doesn't work, I'll come back next week and give a disclaimer. <laughs> Would you bow your heads? Uh, Father, we are sitting here today as a product of our choices. Uh, some of us have a list of regrets that we don't think eternity could erase from our minds, and others of us have a list of hopes that we don't think an eternity could fulfill. And so we live with a kind of anxiety. And I'm asking you to help us today, that you have not called us to live in fear, that everything doesn't have to go right for you to be able to do amazing things in our lives, and that we can actually, in the moment, improvise the information that we have so that we can exercise the kind of freedom that you've given to us by your Holy Spirit and make decisions that are based on your kingdom, not just ourselves. That could be an incredibly joyful and adventurous way to live. And thank you for calling us to live that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand to our feet today.